socialism is popular in Britain. More popular than capitalism, at any rate. That was the result of a YouGov survey last year, in which 36% of respondents expressed a favourable view of socialism, while only 32% expressed an unfavourable one. Capitalism, meanwhile, was viewed unfavourably by 39% of respondents, and only 33% viewed it favourably. You don't have to be a devout believer in free markets to wonder why this is the case, when the catastrophic failure of socialism is visible around the world. Take Venezuela, a country that just a few years ago was being hailed as a panacea of democratic socialism by everyone from Ken Livingston to Noam Chomsky to Bernie Sanders. American journalists talk about how bad a country is because people are lining up for food. That's a good thing. Now, thanks to catastrophic economic mismanagement, Venezuela has gone from being the richest country in South America to being one of the poorest. Its economy shrank by 18.6% last year, while inflation was 800%. Shortages of basic essentials, including food and medicines, have made life in that country unbearable. Every day, thousands of Venezuelans queue to apply for a passport so that they can move to a different country. But without much luck, because the government has run out of plastic to laminate the passports. All of this, despite the fact that Venezuela is the most oil-rich country in the world, Take the two natural experiments where a country has been split into a socialist and a capitalist part. Korea and, before 1990, Germany. Or take Cuba, where the consequences of its 50-year totalitarian experiment are obvious to all who care to look at the evidence. Socialism doesn't work, and it has never worked anywhere for longer than a few years at best. So what explains the enduring appeal of this clearly terrible idea? Every socialist experiment has, at some point, been praised by Western intellectuals. Praise has been dished out even for Stalin's Soviet Union and Mao's China. But socialism's proponents have been very effective at distancing themselves from real-world examples whenever they have ended in tears, as they always do. It is only when the horrors of these regimes can no longer be denied that the socialist left goes strangely silent, or falls back on its favourite catchphrase. But that wasn't real socialism. Real socialism has never been tried. The final recourse of socialism's proponents is usually to argue that true socialism must be democratic, with decisions about economic life being taken by the workers themselves. But consider for a moment how unworkable that would be. Imagine Switzerland, the home of direct democracy, which decides more by referenda than any other country. Now let's pretend that Switzerland went socialist and expanded its model of direct democracy to the newly socialized sectors. This would mean referenda on the production of razors, carpets, gloves, ink cartridges, curtains, kettles, toasters, microwaves, baking trays, washing up liquids, tiles, blenders, pizzas and many, many other things. You would need literally thousands of referenda to organize an economy in this way. Voter turnout would soon drop to rock bottom levels. Economic planning would again become dominated by single issue groups, not ordinary workers. Eventually, all the heavy lifting would have to be delegated to expert committees, at which point real socialism would become unreal again. But it doesn't stop there. The fundamental problem with socialism is that people just don't behave like the socialist planners want them to. This is where the state usually falls back on coercion and intimidation to achieve its ends, by clamping down on alleged saboteurs and speculators. As a result, the socialist state becomes increasingly authoritarian. It's the rejection of private property, of the free market price system, of open competition, and of the natural inclinations of flourishing human beings that makes socialism fundamentally unworkable. But will its proponents ever learn?